you're all set. Thank you. All right. I will call to order the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting for Wednesday, September 28th, 2022. To all persons interested in or affected by the actions of the Zoning Board of Appeals, you are hereby notified pursuant to Section 11, Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and all amendments thereto that a public hearing on the following appeals will be held on Wednesday, September 28, 2022. The Zoning Board of Appeals hearing will be held by remote participation methods. Public access to this meeting shall be provided in the following manner. The meeting will be televised via Channel 18 and may be viewed via the Channel 18 website at http colon slash slash streaming 85.townofbarnstable.us slash cablecast public site. Real-time access to the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting is available utilizing the Zoom link or telephone number and meeting ID provided. Public comment can be addressed to Zoning Board of Appeals by utilizing the Zoom link or telephone number and meeting ID. Uh, the Zoom link is https colon slash slash dash us dot zoom dot us slash j slash 833-722-56140 or by calling one 888 Four seven five four four nine nine and entering the meeting ID eight three three seven two two five six one four zero. Applicants, the representatives, and individuals required or entitled to appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals may appear remotely and may participate through accessing the link and telephone number provided. Documentary exhibits and or visual presentations should be submitted in advance of the meeting to Anna Brigham at town so that they may be displayed for remote public access viewing. Copies of the applications are available for review by calling 508-862-4682 or by emailing anna.brigham at town.barnschool.ma.us. So calling to order, um, introduction of board members. David Hirsch is not here. Herb Bodensieg. Present. Paul Pennard. Present. Todd Volantis. Is not here. Mark Hansen. Present. Aaron Webb. Present. And Denise Johnson. Present. All right. Um, notice recording. Please note this meeting is recorded and broadcast on Channel 18 in accordance with MGL Chapter 30A, Section 20. I must inquire whether anyone is taping this meeting and please make their presence known. Seeing none, um, we do no minutes to approve. Um, and our first item is a discussion and vote. Anna, do you want me to read this into the record? or I mean, it's being continued, right? Right. You don't need to read it. It's just being continued to the 26th. Okay. So we were planning to discuss a request for minor modification of the Katua Residences Comprehensive Permit Number 2005-100. Um, has been requested to be continued to the October 26, 2022 meeting. I need a motion to continue that. Motion to move. Second. I have a first and a second. Um, we need to roll call vote because we're in Zoom world. Herb Bonesig? Uh, I, um, I'm in favor. Paul Pennard? In favor. Mark Hansen? In favor. Aaron Webb? In favor. Denise? Johnson. In favor. And I am also in favor. So that is moved along. Um, in our first matter of old business, we have appeal number 2022-037 MWV Associates LLC has petitioned for variance from section 240-24.1.8C dimensional bulk and other requirements in the HG Highness Gateway Zoning District. The petitioner seeks a variance from the minimum bulk regulations to clarify parcel records and assessing division lines pursuant to the plan prepared by Down Cape Engineering. The subject property is located at 195 Ridgewood Ave, Hyannis, Massachusetts, as shown on assessor's map 328 as parcel 073. It's located in the Hyannis Gateway HG zoning district. This was continued from August 10th and September 14th. Um, and then Additionally, I think at the same time, we'll do appeal number 2022-045. MWV Associates LLC has petitioned for a variance from section 240-24.1.8C, dimensional bulk and other requirements in the HG Highness Gateway Zoning District. Petitioner seeks a variance 
from the minimum bulk regulation to clarify parcel records and assessing division lines pursuant to the plan prepared by Down Cape Engineering. The subject property is located at 313 Ino Road, Highness, Massachusetts, as shown on assessor's map 328 as parcel 235. It's located in the Highness Gateway HG Zoning District. And that was continued from September 14, 2022. Um, so sitting on this will be our regular members, Herb, Paul, Mark, myself, and Aaron. Do you want to sit on this? That was a strong Yep, sorry. Yes. Okay. You mind All right. Mind? Attorney Schultz, are you? Okay. Oh, yes. Um, good evening. Go ahead. A lot of people in this room. Yep, go ahead, Attorney Schultz. All right. Good evening, Chair Dewey uh, and members of the board. For the record, Michael Schultz on behalf of MWV Associates LLC and 63 CIT Avenue LLC. The applicants are seeking a variance from minimal bulk regulations to clarify the lot line between 195 Ridgewood Avenue, <coughs> excuse me, and 313 Iano Road, uh, both in Hyannis, uh, which I'll refer to as the properties. The properties that are the subject of this petition are a series of small lots shown on two different plans from the early to uh, middle 1900s. Uh, the series of small lots are improved with two commercial structures, a 8,465 square foot structure at 195 Ridgewood Avenue and a 3,416 square foot structure at 313 Iano Road. The properties have been developed in their existing state from a 1964 variance, and it was 1964-56. I did append that to a letter that I submitted to the board uh, with attaching the decision itself, the variance, along with the, the plan that was prepared at the time. The plan that was prepared in connection with that variance does exist or evidence the existing and the proposed location of the structures which do remain in the same configuration today. In 1964, when they were developed, the B district had no bulk regulations and the RA1 district had a minimum area of 7,500 square feet. I did append exhibits to my letter that show um, the bylaw in effect in 1969, um, which does contain those bulk regulations and I also appended zoning maps from 1956, 1961, and 1966, which show um, the, the division between the B and the RA district. Uh, with the properties being developed in 1964, which conformed to the bulk regulations at that time, uh, they became uh, protected from subsequent amendments and rendered them non-conforming and remain so protected. The Town of Barnstable Assessing Division has assessed those two parcels um, separately or the properties and has, which has rendered that historic division line. It runs on an odd angle, um, which you can see today, I appended a, a recent copy of the assessing map as exhibit three. So under this appeal, uh, what Down Cape has proposed pursuant to their plan is a lot line that would clarify the old plans and the historic assessing line, which has led to uh, some confusion. Let's see, uh, the, the proposed plan would <clears throat> clearly uh, show uh, two almost equal parcels, um, and it would clarify that lot line. Uh, the plan would comply with all of the bulk requirements of the HDG district, except for the minimum lot area. Um, in support of the variance, uh, appeal number 2022-037 and 2022-045. The petitioners would respectfully suggest that the following findings could be made for a variance. That one, owing to circumstances related to soil conditions, shape or topography of such land or structures and especially affecting uh, such land or structures, but not generally the zoning district in which it is located. Uh, the petitioners would suggest that the shape issue does exist due to the unclear lot lines from the two early 1900 plans depicting a compilation of small lots along with the historic town of Barnstable assessing division lot line, uh, which has uh, been the, uh, from an assessing standpoint and a billing standpoint, uh, the lot line. 
and those lot lines no longer, um, the, the division line between the B and the RA no longer exists. Uh, the petitioners respectfully submit uh, and the board could find that this is a shape issue, um, which is specific to the land um, and does not affect generally the zoning district in which it is located. Uh, secondly, for the finding, a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance would have a substantial hardship, both financial and otherwise to the petitioners. Uh, the lots have been developed uh, since 1964 and protected, uh, but with this confusion um, being unable to be uh, conveyed and that if a variance isn't granted, it would result in substantial hardship, uh, both financially and otherwise to the petitioners. And third, that desirable relief, relief could be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying or substantially derogating uh, from the intent or the purpose of the zoning ordinance. And the petitioners would respectfully submit that the board could find that the clarification of the lot line in the assessing records would be in the public interest uh, to clarify that uh, going forward and in the future. Uh, and then it would not be a substantial detriment to the neighborhood. Uh, that's my presentation. I, I thank you and would be happy to answer uh, any questions the board may have. Thank you, Attorney Schultz. Anyone from the board have any questions for the applicant? Um, Attorney Schultz, uh, Mark Hansen, are there any current um, purchase and sales or any current um, um, documentation that, that this outcome would, would um, would enforce or would would change? Like are, there, are there any current purchase and sale agreements on either of these properties currently? Uh, there is, which provides the standing for 63 CIT Avenue LLC. Okay. Um, so you. they have been a long time. This has been, you know, I want to say probably over a year um, okay. purchase and sale, a lease agreement, which provides them the standing. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on the board? All right. So seeing none, we can open for public comment. Uh, Anna, is anyone or is anyone here for public comment? There's a lot of people in the room. I don't believe so, but I don't know for sure. Uh, there are some people right. representing for Star and, Market, uh, and I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And then I, don't, I know that Commissioner Florence is here, and I believe there was a building inspector. Good They're not speaking on this, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and we did not receive anything, I don't believe, regarding it. That's correct. Okay. Um, so I'll make a motion to close public comment. Second. And a roll call vote on closing public comment. Per Bonesy. I'm in favor. Paul Pennard. In favor. Mark Hansen. In favor. Aaron Webb. In favor. And I am also in favor. So public comment is closed on the two items. Uh, back to the board for any discussion or deliberation. Anyone have any sort of thoughts? Um, we saw, I, I believe the last time we saw these parcels come before was really just for signage for the for the property that was on Iono Road. But th this doesn't in any way affect the drive-through there, does it? I mean, it, use or any of that, anything there? No, no. And, and I think what would be contemplated under, this would be a, a first step, but I think there would need to be um, some, some easements and, and things of that nature to make sure that, um, you know, the passing and repassing for 13, 313 Iona Road would not be impacted. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts? I mean, it's a variance, but Attorney Schultz has nicely laid out um, some help with our, our findings. Um, I don't know how everyone feels about them, if they feel comfortable with them. Paul, did you have something to say? No, I, I think this, um, Obviously, when you have a conflict or ambiguity, we, you know, we have to, um, it's our uh, obligation to try to resolve that so that the, uh, the people who, the owners can get on with their life. So uh, I support um, the uh, petition. 
they don't want to make findings. Again, they're nicely spelled out there. I'll give it a go. All right, go for it. Uh, this is Mark Hansen. Um, <clears throat> with regard to variance number 2022-037, MWV Associates LLC, section 240-2418C, bulk and dimensional regulations in the HZ, HG zoning district. Um, pardon me. M MWV Associates LLC has petitioned for a variance from section 240-241.8C, dimensional bulk and other requirements in the HG High Annis Gateway Zoning District. The petitioner seeks a variance from the minimum bulk regulations to clarify parcel records and assessing division lines pursuant to the plan prepared by Down Cape Engineering. The subject property is located at 195 Ridgewood Avenue, High Annis, Mass. Statutory requirement of MGL Chapter 40A, Section 10 for granting a variance is a three-pronged test. The board is required to find that each of the following three requirements has been met in order to consider granting the variance. One, owing to circumstances related to soil condition, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located, find that the current shape of the lot um, having unclear lot lines, division of small parcels, um, and uh, non-matching uh, non um, plot plans within the within the different um, uh, within the different uh, historical and or town boards, uh, it's find find it confusing uh, confusing <clears throat> to uh, disseminate where those lot lines are. Um, it makes it currently um, unavailable to convey. Two, a little a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner. Um, would find uh, that also that confusion does uh, does make it unavailable to convey and would pose a hardship to the petitioner. Number three, desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning ordinance. Um, we find that the clarification of these lot lines would be both in the public interest and the interest of um, surrounding properties. Those are my findings. I apologize for the stutter there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um We'll take a roll call vote on the fine, or actually, I need a second first. So moved. All right, and a roll call vote on approving the variance based on the findings. Herb Odense. I'm in favor. Paul Pennard. In favor. Mark Hansen. In favor. Aaron Webb. In favor. <clears throat> and I am also in favor. Um, Mark, did you have conditions to go along with the variance? Yes, um, referencing staff report dated July 29th, 2022. I have suggested variance conditions number one through three. And Attorney Schultz, have you reviewed those and are they acceptable to your client? Uh, thank you, I have reviewed them and they are acceptable. All right, so we'll take a roll call vote on the conditions um, as written. Her vote, C. I'm in favor. Paul Bernard. In favor. Mark Hansen. In favor, thank you. Aaron Webb. In favor. And I am also in favor. Um, so Attorney Schultz, you have your variance. Did we reference both of them in those findings? And do you want us to make findings on the second one individually? Yes, please make findings and the conditions for the second one also. Okay. Mark, do you want to do that one too? Uh, yeah, sure. Hopefully better. Is it exactly the same? <laughs> yeah, just that the address is just different. I apologize. I, I, just, I, I had a brain freeze there, but uh, let me see. Sorry. Let me get back out of this.
Okay. Um, let me see here. There we go. That's better. With regard to variance number 2022-045, is the correct one, correct? Yes. Uh, MWV Associates LLC, section 240-2418C, bulk and dimensional regulations in the H3, HG zoning district. Statutory requirement of MGL chapter 48, section 10 for granting a variance is a three-pronged test. The board is required to find that each of the following three requirements has been met in order to consider granting the variance. One, owing to circumstances related to soil conditions, shape or topography, of such land and structures and especially affecting such land or structures but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located. I find that the lot lines are unclear, show a an odd division, uh, especially the diagonal lot line that currently runs through and this would uh, clarify those lines. Number two, a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise to the petitioner. I find that the uh, confusion regarding the lot lines makes the property currently unavailable to convey and also makes it difficult in order to assess. Number three, desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning ordinance. I find that the clarification is in the um, public interest and all the also the interest of the assessor's division and the parties um, to which the purchase and sale is um, held. Those are my findings. Thank you, Mark. I got any a second. This is Paul, I'll second. And a roll call vote. Herb Bogsy. I'm in favor. Paul Pennard. I'm in favor. Mark Hansen. In favor. Aaron Webb. In favor. And I'm also in favor. Um, Mark, again, some suggested conditions. Yes, um, referencing staff report dated August 29th, 2022. I have suggested variance conditions number one through three. Attorney Schultz, have you reviewed those and are they acceptable to your client? I have, thank you. They are acceptable. <laughs> All right, so a roll call vote on the conditions. Herb Bodensee. I'm in favor. Uh, Paul Pennard. I'm in favor. Mark Hansen. I'm in favor. Aaron Webb. In favor. And I'm also in favor. So, Attorney Schultz, you have your variances on those two. Moving on to your next item, appeal number 2022-046, Mark A. Crosby and Scott E. Crosby, trustees of the 30 Crosby Circle Realty Trust, have applied for a special permit pursuant to section <laughs> 240-91H3, develop lot protection, non-conforming lot. The applicants propose to demolish the existing 3,004 square foot dwelling and construct a new 2,281 square foot dwelling with attached garage in accordance with the plans prepared by Sullivan Engineering and K. Marshall Works on a lot containing less than 10,000 square feet of upland. The subject property is located at 30 Crosby Circle, Austral, Massachusetts, as shown on Assessor's Map 116, Parcel 022. It's located in the Residence CRC Zoning District. Um, so sitting on this will be our regular members, Herb Bodensee, Paul Pennard, Mark Hansen, and Denise Johnson, and myself. Good evening, Attorney Schultz, whenever you're ready. Again, Michael Schultz for the record. On behalf of the applicants, Mark A. Crosby and Scott E. Crosby, trustees of 30 Crosby Circle Realty Trust. Uh, the property, which is the subject, subject of this petition, is a single family home located at 30 Crosby Circle in the village of Osterville. Uh, the property contains 8,144 square feet uh, situated within the RC zoning district, um, the AP uh, district, and the, R, the RPOD. Uh, the property is improved with a single family dwelling, which was constructed in approximately 1920, according to town assessing records. Um, the dwelling is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood in terms of size and setback on the lot. Uh, prior, to, prior to appearing before the board this evening, the applicant has received uh, approval from the Barnstable Historical Commission for a full demolition and from the Barnstable Conservation Commission. 
as shown on the plan prepared by Sullivan Engineering and Consulting and elevations prepared by K Marshall Works, the applicant is proposing to demolish the existing single family dwelling and structures at the property and to construct a new single family dwelling. The applicant's proposal meets all of the performance criteria set forth under the as of right provisions for a building permit with the exception that it is located or situated on a lot under 10,000 square feet, which requires relief from the board. Uh, the applicant uh, would respectfully submit to the board that this appeal fulfills and is within the spirit and intent of the ordinance and satisfies the requirements for the issuance of a special permit. Uh, first, that the application falls within a category specifically accepted in the ordinance for the grant of a special permit. Uh, section 24091H3 uh, of the ordinance does allow for this board to issue a special permit provided that there are the required findings uh, that are set forth in that section. Number two, that the proposed dwelling complies with 240H1A. The applicants would submit that the plans prepared by Sullivan and uh, Marshall Works, uh, evidence that the proposed front yard setback is 20.7 feet, uh, which is complying. The side yard setbacks are 10.6, and 11.1 feet respectively. And the rear setback is 14.2 feet, all of which meet the criteria as set forth in the RC district. Number three, um, all of the criteria under section 240H1B1, two and three are met. Uh, the applicants respectfully submit that <clears throat> pursuant to the plans filed with the board, the lot coverage is a 27, 7, which is less than the existing 27.8. The floor area ratio is 0.28 or 28%, which is less than the required 0.3 or 30%. And the building height as defined from the vertical distance grade to the top of the plate is 19 feet, which is less than the required 30. And finally, the proposed dwelling is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing dwelling. Um, after, I think I uh, did send five letters of support to Anna Brigham uh, from members of the uh, community. Um, additionally, uh, I would submit that we have improved the setbacks um, and that we've received the support of the Historical Commission or the, the approval to demolish and the Barnstable Conservation Commission. Uh, with that, I would uh, respectfully request that the board issue a special permit for this and would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Schultz. Um, anyone from the board have any questions? None, seeing none. Um, I think it's relatively straightforward. We see these um, pretty frequently. Um, on these small lots. Uh, let's move open to public comment. So we did receive the five letters that Attorney Schultz just referenced. Um, I'll just give quick um, in, in support from Deborah Foshi at 22, I believe Crosby Circle, um, a letter of support from Scott Crosby at 62 Crosby Circle, a letter of support from Greg Egan at 72 and 73 Crosby Circle, a letter of support from Kelly Curley at 38 Crosby Circle. And the last one here is from Kristen Partit at number 54 Crosby Circle again in support of the project. Um, is there anyone here that wants to speak to this item? Yes, I do. <laughs> Ms. Foshi, just, um, just say your name and address for the record and then whenever you're ready. 22 Crosby Circle, Deborah Foshi. Um, I'm not sure if I understood correctly. Is the proposed dwelling 19 feet high in elevation? I, I thought that's what was discussed. Or is that the current building? What is the proposed building? Uh, the, it's kind of an interesting definition under zoning. So it does not uh, measure from the ground to the ridge line is what you would see at the top of the roof. And so the way that we define it in zoning is from the grade to the top of the structural plate. And so um, from that distance, 
from the grade to the top of the plate is 19 feet. And is the um, the current grade going to change uh, from the, the grade that, I'm sorry, is the proposed grade going to change from the current grade? No. So where I see the ground now is where the beginning would be. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Um, and- Attorney Schultz, do we have a height to the piece available or no? You know, I wish I did, and I'm kicking myself for not asking Marshall Works. Uh, so I think if it's 19 feet to the top of the plate, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, 20, 24 feet. I do see, let me see if I can ask. Um, can I ask what does that mean to the top of the plate? <laughs> so if maybe I could answer this. So basically what this means is the top of plate is the top of the wall. So the second story has a, a double plate, what they call a double two by four at the top of the wall. That's the top of the plate where the roof comes down and meets that. In this particular structure, it actually has a very low pitch roof by the elevations that were provided by the um, by the petitioner. So it, this is, it's not the type of roof where you might see on a common cape. This looks like more of a reverse salt box, uh, sorry, reverse salt box or, or a salt box from the front. So it's, it really from the second floor, if I were to estimate, and I can't say for sure, this is probably about 26 or 27 feet to the top. I'm looking at the elevation. Yeah, let me, let me. It's the 19 feet to the top of the dormer right now is the, the where the two planes meet on the dormer. So it's not that much more to the peak of your roof there. Correct. Right. So, so let me, let me help to the vertical wall is 19 feet. I understand. Thank and you. then the roof takes over from there. I understand. Thank you. And um, you made a distinction uh, initially about the current, uh, including the garage and not including the garage. I'm not so sure why, but um, the, the current building versus the entirety of the current building, including its garage versus the proposed structure, including its garage. Can you speak on that? Somehow you made a distinction about um, talking about the structure entirety, and then the new one would be the structure plus a garage. Can you just discuss that? Uh, sure. Uh, all I was referencing was the, we would be demolishing all of the structures at the property. So if you look behind the house, I believe there's a shed behind the house. Um, so the intent of that was to say we were demolishing all of the structures and rebuilding the house with the detached garage. Oh, a detached garage. That's okay. I mean, a, a, an attached garage. I'm sorry. So okay. the plans show the garage attached. The, the entirety of the square footage currently, including the garage, versus and the proposed entirety of the house, including the garage. Can you tell me that? I didn't understand the question. Could you um, repeat that? Can you just tell me the difference in square footage of the current <clears throat> house plus garage and the proposed house plus garage? Um, Your lot coverage, basically, Michael. Thank you. Well, House plus garage would be great. Yeah, I'm trying to read the plan. I'm sorry. So let's see. Existing lot coverage, 2,265 square feet of existing and proposed lot coverage, 2,262. Okay. So that's by three feet. And that's including house and garage together, right? That's okay. correct. Thank you. Appreciate that. Are there any other members um, on the call from the public want to speak to this? All right, seeing uh, none. Uh, uh, there any other? Mr. Oh. Mr. Chairman, let me, I'm reading the application. It says they want to demolish a 3,004 square foot dwelling. And that's not what I just heard. I think it's the second floor. Yeah, we were looking at, we were talking lot coverage before is what Mike was talking about. So footprint to footprint. Okay, gotcha. Um, and was there any other um, letters or anything received that I've missed here from the No, public? just those five letters of support that Attorney Schultz had submitted. Okay. Okay, and I just wanted to be sure, I'm sorry, uh, that's what I was asking, square footage versus square footage, not just lot coverage. Um, that was the question I did ask. Can you answer that one? Attorney Schultz, through you. Yep, so it, it, it's 3,004 square feet dwelling and the new dwelling is 2,281. It's 
plus the garage, I believe, yeah, so right? Yeah, including the garage. Because you're, I think you're yeah. describing to me the current one is including the garage, if I'm not mistaken. Let's do apples for apples. It's all I'm asking for. Thank you. Right, and I don't think that the architect provided the apples for apples. It was taken from the town website. With the assessing division provides those square footages online. Um, so we were taking those square footages from the town assessing office. And those so, square footages are what? Let's, I'll add them myself. What are they? 3,004 current, 2281 proposed. Okay, so the 3,000. But that's not including the garage, I don't think, yeah. Mark. Is oh, maybe house? not. Yeah, oh, sorry. Gosh. I'm sorry. The 3,004 is what? House or house and garage? It's all of the gross floor area of the existing structure. Okay. Fine. And then, yeah. And then um, the proposed structure of the house and garage is what? Um, well, it's excluded from the present calculation that's provided does not include the square footage, square feet of the garage. The, um, the proposed. I think it's clear what's being asked is what's the square footage of the existing dwelling plus garage and what's the square footage of the proposed dwelling plus garage. Thank you. So the existing building is 3,004 square feet. The existing garage is 420 square feet. Okay. So, so that's your existing. Plus 420. Based on assessor's records. I'm just looking at assessor's record. So the new structure will have what? Yeah. So what's the new structure? 2,281 square feet. Total plus the, the, plus the garage, right? Plus the garage. Yeah, we need the dimensions of the garage. That's what we're looking for. Try. Is, um, hold on. It should be on the site. Garage is uh, 29 by, looks like 27. That's about. Yeah, I believe it. It's 800 on, uh, square feet. 700 square feet, 716. So the answer is 3,004 plus 706, so 3,710 feet, is that right, square feet? No. no. Um, it's, yeah, making us do math tonight. <laughs> I know, off the cuff, and I don't have the architect here to help no, me. No, it's, it's um, 2,281 plus the garage. Right. So total is 3,064. So the, the proposed structure is, uh, is slightly larger than the existing structure. 60 square feet. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Um, if there's no one else to speak to this, then um, I will make a motion to close public comment. Second. We need a second. Oh, okay, we got a second and a roll call vote on closing public comment. Herb Bodensee. I'm in favor. Paul Pinard. In favor. Mark Hansen. In favor. Denise Johnson. In favor. And I am also in favor. Uh, so it brings us back to the board for deliberations or findings. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions or concerns here? Other than it's a really good looking plan. <laughs> I mean, it's, we see this all the time, but it, it's really, you know, it's pretty okay. handful. I'll do findings if you want, Jake. All right, go ahead, Paul. Okay, uh, this concerns appeal 2022-046, 30 Crosby Circle Realty Trust. Mark A. Crosby and Scott E. Crosby, trustees of 30 Crosby Circle Realty Trust, have applied for a special permit pursuant to sections 240-91H3, develop lot protection, non-conforming lot. The applicants, proposed, the applicants proposed to demolish the existing 3,004 square foot dwelling and construct a new 2,281 foot dwelling with attached garage extra in accordance with the plans prepared by Sullivan Engineering and K Marshall Works on a lot containing less than 10,000 square feet of upland. The subject property is located at 30 Crosby Circle, Austin, Mass. As shown in the assessor's map 116, 
parcel 022 is located in residence C, RC zoning district. I find that the application falls within a category specifically accepted in the ordinance for grant of a special permit. Section 240-91H3 allows for demolition and rebuilding of a non-conforming lot. I find that the site plan, site plan review is not required for single family residential dwellings. I find that after evaluation of all the evidence presented, the proposal fulfills the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance. It would not represent a substantial detriment to the public good in the neighborhood effective uh, to wit the five um, uh, abutting neighbors support of the project. Number four, the proposed yard setbacks must be equal to or greater than the yard setbacks of the existing building. I found that the existing northerly side yard setback is 11.2 feet. The rear yard setback is 9.9 .9 feet. The southerly yard set setback is 16.1 feet. And the front yard setback is 21.5 feet. The proposed northerly side setback, side yard setback is 10.6 feet, which is less than the 11.2. The rear yard setback is 14. Point two feet, which is less than the 9.9, .9, greater than 9.9. .9. The southerly yard setback is 11.1 feet, and the front yard setback is 20.7. All setbacks are less than the existing ones today. The required setbacks are 20 feet front, are 20 front feet, side and rear are 10 feet. Five, I find the proposed lot cover, uh, the proposed lot coverage should not exceed 20% or the existing lot coverage, whichever is greater. I find the proposed lot coverage is 27.7%, a reduction from the existing coverage of 27.8%. The floor area ratio shall not exceed 0.30 or 30%, the existing floor area ratio of the structure being demolished, whichever is greater. I find the, the proposed floor is 28%, which is less than 30%. The building height and feet shall not exceed 30 feet to the highest plate and shall contain no more than no more than two and a half stories. I find that the proposed height is 19 feet to the plate, 30 feet maximum, and is two stories. I find that the proposed new dwelling would not be substantially more detriment to the neighborhood than the existing dwelling to wit the five uh, abutting uh, in favor of it. Those are my findings. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we will take a, I need a second first. Second. And a roll call vote. Um, Herb Bodensee. I'm in favor. Paul Pennard. In favor. Mark Hansen. I'm in favor. Denise Johnson. Favor. And I am also in favor. Um, do you have some uh, special conditions for that, Paul? I do. Uh, uh, these are conditions that are um, hang on here. One through six uh, from the staff report um, dated whatever. September 8th. September 8th. September 8th. I knew I would get help there. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> Attorney Schultz, uh, you've reviewed those. Are those acceptable? Uh, they are. Thank you. So those are the additions. All right. A roll call vote on the conditions. Uh, Herb and seek. I'm in favor. Paul Penarden. I'm um, in favor. Uh, Mark Hansen. I'm in favor. Denise Johnson. In favor. And I am also in favor. Did we have to so second that? Schultz. I just wanted to check. We don't normally. I'm okay, I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yep. Not a motion, I don't think. Okay. Um, so moving along, uh, Attorney Schultz, you're all set. Thank you yeah, very thank much. Thank you all very much. Moving along to appeal number 2022. Thank you. Appeal number 2022-047, TRT Hyannis LLC slash Star Market Company, Inc. has filed an appeal of administrative official decision in accordance with section 240-125B1A. The building commissioner issued a cease and desist order on August 1st, 2022. The violation states... The refrigeration trailer parked at a loading dock on the side of the building has been used over an extended period of time to provide additional storage for the operation of the store. 
which is an expansion of use, and as such, it would be presented to, to site plan review for a pursuant to section 240-100C. The subject property is located at 625 West Main Street, Hyannis, Massachusetts, as shown in assessor's map 248 as parcel 076. It's located in the Highway Business HB Zoning District. Um, so sitting on this will be our regular members, uh, uh, President Herb Bodenseek, Paul Pinard, Mark Hansen, um, Aaron Webb, and myself. I do have to disclose I was a uh, notice to butter. I own property within a radius of there. Aaron, go ahead. Could I um, uh, step aside and let Denise take over this one as they are, you know, uh, right across the street from my current business. So I prefer not yep. to get involved. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Denise, you'll sit on this as well as, as uh, on this as well. Um, is everyone else okay to sit on it? All right. Uh, so I will pass it to um, Commissioner Florence. Do you want to start here? Or do you want to have the uh, give us a background? Good evening, Mr. Chair. Um, my I think it's appropriate for the applicant for the petitioner to make their case. Uh, Mr. Paolo, uh, if you'd like to go ahead. It's Attorney McCarthy. Okay. okay. Oh, she's showing us. Um, we can't see you. We just Can you just state your name and your position? Can you just state your name and position Andrea, for the applicant. Yes, my name is Andrea McCarthy. I am the attorney for the applicant. Um, and I have okay. also on the call is Joe Ferreira, who is the district manager of Star Market, and Alex Poala, who is the store manager. Um, we're pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 15. We noticed the appeal of the decision of the Building Commissioner, which was dated August 1st, 2022. Um, this property is owned by TRT Hyannis LLC. It was leased to the Stop and Shop Supermarket, um, who entered into a sublease with the current tenant, Star Market Company, um, which was dated, the sublease was dated July 5th, 1996. So Star Market has been in this location um, for since that date, which is over approximately 26 years. This is a 4.75 acre parcel in the highway business zone. It was constructed in 1965 as a supermarket and consists of 35,481 square feet. Um, and in, in at earlier date, the building commission made an on-site visit and he indicated to the store manager and others that they had received a noise complaint. Um, there's no noise regulation that can be relied on um, within the town of Bonstable. So it was determined that this was then an expansion of use because of the refrigeration pet trailer that was parked at the loading dark dock, which Star Market has used since it's been in this location and they use it every store. The Town of Bonstable zoning ordinance that was cited by the commissioner was chapter 240, section 100C, which specifically states any alteration, expansion, reconstruction, or modification to the existing condition of a structure or any change of use which would necessitate the provision of additional off-street parking, additional lot area, or any other site alteration in order for such structure or use as so changed to comply with all the requirements of this chapter. Um, clearly, we feel that this does not fall within chapter 240, section 100C, and that since the inception, Star Market and previous to Star Market, the uh, super stop and shop or stop and shop, at, as it was called at the time, obtained all required permits at the time of the improvement of the property, including the building permit. The use has remained the same since 1965 with STAR since 1996, which as I indicated was 26 years. The trailer has used, been used since inception of STAR market that any of the managers or um, people that work at STAR are aware of. Um, since there's no noise regulations, um, it's our position that the town should not be able to use the um, trying to have Star go in for a special permit with respect to using a refrigeration trailer. 
Um, this Star Market has never received any complaints in the store from customers, the town, or anyone until the first time that the building commissioner came on site and indicated that there were noise complaints. Um, this is not a permanent structure. They have now, in order to accommodate um, the people who complained of the noise, which they're not aware of who they are, um, they've moved the trailer to the other another side of the store um, to try and accommodate them and prevent any noise. Um, certainly, it's our position that the use of a refrigeration trailer at a loading dock, which has been used since Star Market for a portion of the year since the sublease was entered into does not fall within Chapter 240, Section 100C. Um, this use does not necessitate the provision of additional off-street parking, additional lot area, or any other site alteration. There has been no alteration or expansion of the building or structure, which is required to ne necessitate additional permitting as suggested. There's nothing in the zoning law, bylaw, for the town of Bonstable that prevents this use of a trailer on the, on the property. Um, and as indicated, it has nothing to do with um, the cited statute as there has been no change to require a special permit. It's strictly in response to the alleged noise violation. Therefore, the applicant respectfully requests that the board overturn and null the decision of the building commissioner and find that Star Market and the owner has not violated the zoning ordinances. Thank you, and um, we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, all right, does anyone have any questions for the applicant at this point? Did you say it's standard practice that um, these trailers are, are with most of the star markets? Yes, it's used at every star market. This is only one trailer, just to clarify. That's okay. not multiple. No, but it's it's a common practice among the star markets. Correct. Every store has one of these to help. And one of the reasons why they have it and it's necessary down the Cape is because if they had lose power, hurricane storms, um, it wouldn't destroy stock and it can help with the community in times of crisis. Mark, do you have a comment? Go ahead. I do. It's just a, a couple of really quick questions. So I'm familiar with the location. Um, I, I guess I, I understand that they're probably commonplace. What I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, this trailer sits probably with 100 feet of a housing unit complex. Um, I'm assuming, and probably this will become more clear once we hear from um, town officials, if, if the noise is coming from the compressor from that system, I'm assuming that this truck isn't the original truck that was with the property, uh, you know, 26 years ago. I mean, it, we don't know anything about the, the maintenance of it. Is the engine vibrating? Is it creating a noise? Um, I would be curious if, if they actually know who the applicant is and whether or not that uh, the move has satisfied that person whoever they may be so it's kind of hard to tell if you know has that been, has there been any further complaints up to this point so that, that would be some of my quick thoughts um prior to hearing commissioner florence yeah let's hear from mr florence because we have to remember here we're, we're looking at his determination and upholding or overturning his decision not looking at if this is you know a detriment to the neighborhood or, or something of that nature so let's turn over Commissioner Florence and his team to, to bring us up to speed on, on their position. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello again, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Brian Florence. I'm your building commissioner. Um, just to touch on a couple of quick things, um, the petitioner said that our initial response out there was due to a noise complaint, and that part of that is partially accurate. Um, but even if that was the only reason that we were there, the a direct observation of the violation is probable cause for us to bring additional um, uh, additional charges uh, against the property, and it and it does give us standing when we do make observations like that. Um, the petitioner didn't say exactly why the expansion doesn't apply to 240, only to uh, uh, that only to relied upon a complaint. So. 
Um, I, I, I'd like to just go ahead and give you a little bit of background about what we did and why we did it. And uh, um, if you'll hear me, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, on July 7, 2022, the building division received a complaint concerning the property located at 625 West Main, um, obviously Shaw Supermarket. The complaint originated from an occupant of the Cape Winds Resort and stated that a freestanding refrigeration trailer had been parked at the loading dock and was running loudly throughout the night. Uh, the complaint was entered, entered into the decision, uh, excuse me, the division's code compliance program, and an inspector was assigned and investigated the matter. After multiple site visits uh, to view conditions and having discussions with both the assistant store manager and the store manager, it was clear that the trailer in question was being used for the season to expand their freezer capacity to meet the demands of the store. The trailer's refrigeration unit runs constantly cycling on and off to maintain the interior temperature of the, of the, of the um, trailer. It should also be noted that the inspector spoke with staff at the Cape Winds Resort, the abutter with, um, who was also the abutter, and was informed that not all guests complained about the noise, but multiple guests had requested to change the units uh, that they were staying in and to be located on the other side of the property to, to get relief from the noise. Uh, on August 1st, a notice of violation was issued for the expansion of the business uh, by operating the refrigerator trailer to supplement their store storage needs under Section 240-100C, requiring site plan review for further regulatory review of the expansion. So that took place, and when I noticed that the applicant had, had filed an appeal with this board, um, I gave them a call, and, and I spoke to the uh, attorney, Andrew McCarthy. Um, I, I just want to discuss their concerns because site plan review um, is not a, a burdensome process. So I explained, that site, I explained to her that site plan review wasn't a burdensome process, but it's just a process that's in place and is required of all of our business owners who wish to expand their business. Uh, Attorney McCarthy indicated that they understood that the site plan review was a, a relatively simple process and that, that no other besides that would be required. Uh, she indicated that they wish to use this tactic in order to avoid obtaining a site survey. Um, I don't, I, I guess I don't blame them for that and I completely understand it. Um, but site plan review, as, as many of you folks on the board here know, is really is not a, a burdensome process. It's an opportunity for staff to go look at the, um, at, at the proposal, get an understanding of whether or not it's gonna be a detriment to the neighborhood or if there are any regulatory matters that apply. And in this case, if you if reading the purpose and intent of the zoning ordinance, one of the issues that they that it, it brings forth is the, this idea of noise and congestion and, and dust and other things that that make a neighborhood um, uncomfortable to live in. And so, um, yes, uh, Mr. Hansen, the the noise is from the compressor. The compressor cycles on and off repeatedly. And and Member Johnson, I would say that well. Um, Star Market may be using a trailer as, as a supplement during the season to keep items cold. Uh, we can certainly appreciate that. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that every grocery store or shopping mart uses them. Uh, so we determined that that's not customarily incidental and that further review should be required. So we just ask them to come to site for interview. Again, it's, it's not a burdensome uh, process for you. But I would like to, if, if uh, the board would allow, um, just to read what Site Plan 101 says. Um, 240 101 reads No activity within the scope of 240 100 herein shall be carried out without an approved site plan thereof. Any work done in deviation from the approved site plan shall be a violation of this chapter, unless such deviation is approved in writing by the building commissioner as being of no significant detriment to the achievement of any purpose set forth. If this was a trailer attached to a, a tractor, like a tractor trailer, um, I would have determined that it was no significant detriment to the uh, purposes of site plan review. Absolutely, that's customarily and incidental. Those structure, those trucks need to move in and move out to be able to drop off product. Um, but this thing is sitting there up against a property, uh, against people who sleep, and the thing is cycling on and off at night. If it were further from the property line, that might be a whole different story. Um, so we did ask for uh, additional review, and I'm not sure that the board can actually grant the relief that's being requested. I'm not sure that you can 
say that a section of the board, a section of the ordinance is not required when it's not a dimensional or use matter, really. It's really a function of whether or not they come before site plan review. Um, so with that, I will leave this in your hands and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Florence. Uh, does anyone from the board have questions for, for him, for Commissioner Florence or the applicant at this point? Yeah, I'd like to ask the um, attorney for the plaintiff um, if they have had similar problems at their other stores, uh, which he stated that they do this similar storage at basically all their stores. No, we have not. And like I indicated previously, they use these trailers at every store. And um, this has been being used in this location for the time that Star Market has been there, so approximately 26 years. Um, it's the first time that there's been a noise complaint, and I, we truly believe that this does not fall within Section 240, uh, Chapter 240, Section 100C. That it's basically based on a noise violation, and there's no expansion of use. They have not changed the use. They've been doing it for years, and it is customary for our market to have a trailer at these locations. Yeah, it seems more like a noise issue and i've looked into noise issues in the town bylaws before and there's almost nothing you can do there's a, a decibel um re, uh, limit within so many feet of a property line or something like that but there's i think it basically only applies to music and i think that's the bigger problem is noise in this town there's no restriction on it and i think that what that's what needs to be looked at but that's not what we're here for of course um but another thing is um and not really to the attorney as much as just in general i see storage trailers behind almost every store i go by there's you know a bunch of stores around town that you can see the rear of their of their store at the loading dock area. And there's one in particular, I won't say the name of it, but it's been there so long <laughs> that the, uh, the logo of the store is faded. It looks like it's been there for 20 years. It's not refrigerated and it's not next to, it's next to a hotel, but it's not refrigerated. So there isn't the noise problem. And so, I think you know we should call um, call the problem out for what it is. The problem is noise, not and another issue I'd have is uh, and it's kind of relative to this tiny house um, trend nowadays. The way tr t tiny houses get away with it is that they're mobile. They are temporary, and this trailer it's on wheels. Maybe it's been there for twenty years, but it's still temporary. So I think that's about all I have to say that I can think of. I'll probably come up with something else later, but right, go uh, ahead. thank you for your time. Um, quick question, if somebody might be able to answer from, uh, from start. How long has this particular trailer been in place? Um, let uh, me not, ask not a either. trailer, this trailer. Joe, no, I understand. Let me ask um, that question to Joe Ferreira or Alex Paola, how long this particular trailer has been being used. But I do want to make one comment. They have moved it to accommodate the noise complaint and put it near the condensers so it can't be heard because they just want it to be good neighbors. So um, if Joe or Alex could answer how long, if you're aware of how this, this how long you've had this particular trailer, that would be great. I mean, if you don't know, it's fine. I'm just trying to determine, is this a newer trailer? Is it a very old trailer? I mean, um, this type of noise does have a, uh, my experience has been this type of noise does have a, a way of traveling. And I, I know that, or it's my understanding, and maybe Commissioner Florence can speak to this, is that within a certain distance of housing, you, you, can't, you can't disrupt people's um, use of their property. And I, I, I believe that was 100 feet. 
And I'm wondering, is this prop is this trailer now outside of 100? Hang on, Mark. Before we get too far into this, no. It's only to determine not what's before us. Is not. No, I understand. I understand. I've I've been trying to determine. Mark, that's irrelevant. The the issue is the noise. There's no noise uh, ordinance. I've been there before in terms of that. Is there no noise ordinance? I mean, it's housing. This is my question. I'm just no. It's a noise, and they say there isn't. Then that's fine. It's it's a noise ordinance. That's the whole issue here that we're talking about. I understand. There is no. I don't care if it's 100 feet or 40 feet or 2,000 feet. Because there are rules about that. No, there isn't. Not in, with respect to a noise. Excuse me, Herb Bonsi. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's, let's just move things back into to check here. All right, Commissioner Florence, go ahead. Please give us some clarity. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, respectfully, this has nothing to do with noise. The, the refrigeration in the building is inadequate, and so therefore they brought in additional refrigerator, refrigeration equipment to expand that use. Um, temporary doesn't mean anything under the zoning ordinance except as it relates to tents and living in trailers. So you, it, doesn't, nothing, it doesn't buy you anything to have a structure there that's gonna come and go. Tiny houses are not permitted in the town of Barnstable. So there's not, the, the issues that are being brought up as it relates to noise and temporary uses are not at issue here. This really is just about an expansion of the refrigeration components of the building and spreading it out into other areas on the parcel. Those those areas are also being um, using up areas that are supposed to, that were approved under site plan review for moving trucks, uh, for trucks moving materials in and out of there not stationary parking on that spot. It's an expansion of the refrigeration. That's all, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney McCarthy, can you just give a little clarity or, or one of the store um, employees, are, is this powered by, call it shore power here? Is this plugged into the building or are we running on a generator all the time? It's a condenser. But the, it's running off electricity that is coming from the store structure. Diesel. It's running off a diesel generator? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a diesel condenser. It's a diesel run in, runs the condenser. The condensers need electricity. So when the thing's plugged Nothing into a else. truck. No, it, it's it's not plugged into the building at all. What it is, it's, it's fuel. It's a diesel fuel that runs that condenser. So we have a company that comes in to fill it every so often. Thank you. Okay. So there's a fuel tank sitting inside this thing that's being filled on a weekly basis to run the generator, to run the condenser. Well, he didn't say weekly. Um, I don't know how someone often. Else okay. Alex, want to respond to his question, how often the uh, diesel company goes there? And uh, I, I would like to hear uh, Attorney McCarthy address the issue of expansion of use. Well, I disagree that it's an expansion of use, and the building commissioner admitted that this complaint was initiated by noise, which is what brought him out to the property in the first place. And that there were multiple, when I spoke to him, he told me that they had multiple people that complained of noise. So he thought that was enough to get past this um, stepping stone. So under Chapter 240, Section 100C, it specifically states that any alteration, expansion, reconstruction, or modification of the existing condition of a structure or any change of use which would necessitate the provision of additional off-street parking, additional lot area, or any other site alteration in order for structure or use are so changed to comply with the requirement. This does not fall within Chapter 240 and um, 100C. It is clearly a noise violation. The refrigeration trailer has been used. It is portable. Um, They have moved it. It's, um, as I indicated before, that it's been being used for 26 years. And they've never had any complaints at this store until this recent incident that there was any noise from customers, the town, or anyone. But Attorney McCarthy, 
they understand that the reason the building department and special services came out was because of a noise complaint, but that's not what they're violating you on. They're saying that this is an expansion of Correct. Or use they had to come up with something or a because it really um, was. I guess we have to determine considering the, this trailer structure. Yeah, I understand that, but that's what we're saying is that it does not fall within Chapter Two Forty One Hundred C, which would require that they have to get a special permit. But so uh, what the, special let me understand. So Two Forty. Doesn't 240 say expansion of use? It says an alteration, says, expansion, reconstruction, or modification to the existing conditions of a structure, which would be the building, or any change of use, which would necess necessitate the provision of additional off-street parking, which I don't think this necessarily means additional off-street parking because it's not taking up parking spaces, although where it is now, I believe it is taking up some parking spaces, um, and it, or additional lot area, which is taking up additional lot area or other site alteration in order for such structure or use as so changed to comply with all the requirements of the chapter. So I, I suggest that McCarthy, the where it is parked now, is that across existing parking spaces or that's in a loading zone? I, I didn't see where it's parked now. Um, Alex, can you answer this? It's parked where the loading it, I know it's, it's parked at the loading dock. It's a, it's a loading zone. It's not any parking space for any uh, customer parking at all. I thought it was moved from the rear of the building. It was. It was moved from, from the rear of the building that abuts uh, next to the property that's, that's in question here. It's a complaint, but it was moved to the other side of the building where there are... Uh, there's uh, docks that are there also, to, which allows the trailer to go into that location. So I, I suggest I, I'm, the issue before the board is, is this an expansion of use or not? It seems to me that's the question we're right. dealing with. And is this an expansion of the structure? No. Well, that's the issue. Is it an expansion? But of a shed, use? we consider a shed an expansion, correct? Commissioner Florence, I think you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Paul. I, I don't know your last name. I'm sorry, sir. Um, so it's an expansion of use. So there's use in buildings. So there's dimensional stuff that is associated with buildings and there is expansion of use. In this case, it's an expansion of the use. And, and that is in that the refrigeration located in the building was not enough. So they had to expand the use by adding more refrigeration. My question is, is that if, if you're going to make it about the issue of expanded use, then if we drive around and we go to Stop and Shop or Whole Foods or any of those places, are we going to find the same thing? Because I was in uh, BJ's about a month ago and was looking for a specific thing, and someone said, I have to go back out to the truck to see if we have it in the freezer. So I'm just wondering, is this going to open up a can of worms that this is a common industry practice. Member Johnson, this is the nature of my business. Um, we, are, <laughs> we are a complaint-based organization. We don't have policing abilities. We don't have you know 200 inspectors to go out and police the town. So unfortunately, what the way these things get to us is we receive a complaint, we go out and investigate. Yeah, it may come in as a complaint of, of a uh, setback nonconformity, but we get out there and find that the setback nonconformity is fine, but the height that they're putting a building on, so we have to bring that case. And the bottom line here is, yes, we went out there on a noise complaint. We found that the noise ordinance didn't apply. Uh, Mr. Bodenzeek was right. It didn't apply. Mr. Uh, Paul was right. It didn't apply. But what did apply was the fact that they've expanded their use to include a trailer. So we said, Look at easy fix, folks. Why don't you come on in, site plan review. The section of the ordinance requires that you do that. We'll take a look. We'll see if there's any regulatory issues that you're up against. We'll have that discussion and call it a day. And they said, no, we'd rather do this. So I said, okay. But we're a complaint-based organization. We don't have 300 inspectors to go out and police everybody. It's not going to create a precedent. 
it's not going to change anything or make anything new in our operations. Well, I'm just trying to respond to Chairman Dewey's comment that we're 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 doing this on the basis of expanded use, but you're saying the issue you're bringing is the noise, and then I'm I still don't understand whether there is or isn't a noise um, part of the you know violation. There is not. I've said repeatedly that this is not, we have not cited them on noise. That's not an issue for us. I know Ms. McCarthy keeps saying that, but that is not what we are, uh, we've cited them on. We've cited on something completely different, and that is expansion of use, with, and that is by expanding the, uh, they had a need to expand their refrigeration capacity by putting a trailer on the outside. No, it's not a building, but the fact of the matter the expansion of the refrigeration co uh, component of that building. Can I make a comment? I, the reason why it's not a noise violation is because there is no noise um, bylaw in the town of Bonstable. Additionally, there's nothing in the bo uh, zoning law bylaws that I could find that prevents the use of this type of trailer. And it is commonplace and it is used by all the different stores all over town. If you drive by them, you will see them. Yep. She wants to keep saying that this is about noise. It's not. It's about an expansion. And the use of the trailer is correct. There is nothing in there that says that they can't have a trailer. There is an issue with the expansion under Section 240-100 uh, that they have, in, they have a need to increase their freezer capacity. That's all. And all they need to do to, to have it looked at is come to site plan review. Very simple fix. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry. To didn't clarify, Aaron, just to clarify, you recused yourself or you, I just I, didn't yeah, I, I, I just, I, I just, I guess I'll just make it known that I am in a, I, I do own an operated business across the street, but I. I yeah, hold, on, just, just hold on one second. Let me open public comment first then. Just hang on one second. Okay, so I'm going to open public comment on this. Aaron, go ahead. You're speaking as a, a member of the public. So again, I am a, uh, I do own a business across the street. Um, I, you know, I, I struggle with this slightly because we're talking about a supermarket that is moving in and out uh, product uh, continually day after day. And, and with all due respect to Commissioner Florence and um, Assistant uh, Building Commissioner Jeff Carter, you know, the noise over there is constant. It is, it is, and again, I know this isn't necessarily about noise, but the trailer is, you know, uh, just that. It's a trailer. They've moved it, so it does move. It's not a permanent fixture. Uh, whether it does assist their business or not, um, you know, I don't necessarily know. I'm taking Attorney McCarthy's word for it that uh, it stays there, you know, there to assist their business. Um, but it is a supermarket and supermarkets, including restaurants and convenience stores and all over town, uh, accept and move trailers around um, 24 seven in this town. And, and to me that, uh, you know, it's, it speaks to their ability to do business. And so I'm not quite sure. Um, and I, I am struggling with the um, reason for you know, the expanded use and uh, whether or not it, it falls within that category or not. So, um, I, you know, I, I, again, this was, I think Attorney McCarthy's point about the noise is that the noise is what brought this to your attention. And therefore, when you guys went to investigate, which again, you're a complaint based business is what you do. Um, you discovered that this might be an issue or you were sort of looking to uh, you know, come to a resolution. And, and I do understand Commissioner Florence's point about coming to site plan review, although that's not a simple just come to site plan review and get signed off on, although it can be that way for sure. But there also may be additional requirements that Attorney McCarthy and her clients are concerned about that might lead to multiple more steps other than just appealing um, uh, this, uh, your decision. So I think they have a right to do that, obviously, and that's why we're here. So, I, you know, it's... Um, it's definitely complicated. I, I don't know necessarily how, as a member of the public, I would lean, except just to know that the ability for them to do business and requires uh, trailers coming in and out, um, as my business does, and as, as any refrigerated business in town does. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the trade winds does abut the property. It's right next door, but it's not as if that's a secret really to anybody other than somebody who might go there un not knowing that it butts the back of a loading dock. Um, but that's 
you can't change that fact. And in fact, Tradewinds has a split, a, a uh, fence up uh, to my knowledge. Uh, I believe it's owned by Tradewinds. It might be owned by the star market that sort of uh, separates the two properties. Um, it's a stockade fence. There's several sections have been missing over the years. Um, uh, you know, so I do think that stop and shop uh, as a member of the public is a relatively good neighbor and an important part of the uh, area. And as is the trade winds, um, so it's it's a difficult um, difficult situation. But again, I think the ability for them to use the trailer to assist their business is what's pertinent here. And in my opinion, it is part of uh, the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Public speak on this, and we didn't receive anything, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. So let's close public comment. And then we can I to make a comment if I can this more if we'd like to. Uh, oh, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, speak up, please. Yes, Just introduce name your Robert, name and your address yep. and records. My name is Robert Werlow, and I am a owner at the Cape Winds Resort. My family comes here quite often. We take advantage of the owner's rental program, and I made the original complaint. I'd also like to say that uh, I checked with management today of the resort and they were never notified of this meeting. I don't know if there was a need to notify the abutters, but they did not receive any notification. I'd also like to clarify a few things which were erroneously presented by the attorney. The trailer has not been moved. They have brought in a second trailer and placed it in the rear of the loading dock. There is a above constant 50 decibel droning of this thing when it's operating. It's like having a weed whacker go off in front of your bedroom window all night long, every day. Uh, it's not a tractor trailer where there's coming and going, where they're unloading and loading, and another one comes in and leaves. Uh, in, in one sentence, they say it's temporary for the seasonal, yet it's been there forever. Um, and the excuse of, well, we've been doing this forever, everybody does it, it's like when you get pulled over speeding. They only pick out one car, everyone else is speeding, that doesn't fly. Uh, it's just... And to say that there was no complaints at all in all the years, uh, I have to dispute that because I've spoken with the management at Cape Winds and they said they have talked to people over at Star Market. Mr. Warlow, thank you very much for your comment and thank you for being here tonight. Yes. All right, is there anyone else here to speak in public comment? All right, seeing none, I will make a motion to close public comment. I need a second. Second. All right, roll call vote on closing public comment. Herb Bodensey. In favor. Paul Pennard. In favor. Uh, Mark Hanson. In favor. Denise Johnson. In favor. And I am also in favor. So public comment is closed. Um, we'll bring it back to the board here to sort of deliberate this. Does anyone have any thoughts or feelings or specific questions or clarifications they'd like on it? Uh, one clarification, okay. Mr. Chairman. It was at the time when the sublease was taken over and it started to proceed as its current uh, occupant, was the trailer, was a trailer in that position at that point? I have been informed by Star Market that it was, and it has been used since its inception in 1996. Okay, and just to clarify, the trailer that he was speaking of is a different trailer, um, which has not been running. The, the one that he said hasn't been moved. The one that was running that has the condenser was moved. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Go ahead, Pat, Paul. Yeah, I think the issue here is one of, uh, and only is one of expansion of use. Uh, that's the complaint was, uh, uh, the uh, ruling by the uh, by Mr. Florence was made on expansion of use. And so I think the issue before the board is, is not noise, 
it is expansion of use. And uh, I, I propose that that's, that's correct. The... Yes, that is correct. Ms. McCarthy, I have two questions. Who owns the trailer? Um, I, Alex, could you answer that, please? Mr. Chairman, I think Carlos uh, is having a problem with his microphone. He keeps closing, okay. shutting. Yep. But there's no. Noise Somebody there. just texted me and said my mic isn't working. But so I just asked him who owns the trailer. Oh, CJ okay. and Jim. Yeah, do you know who owns the trailer? Who's registered? Is the trailer? Sorry, say that again. He said CJ and J. At a leasing company is okay. and that's yeah. a star market company or not no it's not a star market company it's one of the trucking firms that we use uh, actually clifford Parham does our transportation so they deliver the trail but it's part of the trail that we lease from C C J and J. okay thank you so the trailer is registered and insured to go over the road at this point that is correct but that trail, that specific trailer unit is not getting swapped out on a monthly basis or an every other week basis or anything. That same one is sitting at Star Market for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, that particular trail has been there uh, since May. Okay. And who's servicing the trailer? Who's coming to service the generator and the condenser on it? Someone's coming to that your site for that? Uh, yes, there is a, an outside firm that comes in and services the trailer and uh, replenishes the diesel fuel also. So the question, it came there in June. Uh, uh, did it replace another trailer, similar trailer? Yes, he it was said another. May, just clarify. Well, okay, May or June. It, so it replaced a similar trailer. That is correct. And uh, how long will this existing trailer be there? It all depends on the needs, it, you know, whether, uh, you know, there's product coming in or whatever the case may be. And we also keep a trail there through the course of the, you know, once we get into the fall and winter, uh, in case of uh, bad weather, we have uh, quite often have lost power in that particular location. I've had refrigeration issues where we've had to use the freezer, uh, the uh, reefer. Okay, so, so uh, uh, that trailer or a similar trailer with refrigeration, is there year round? Is that correct? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What was that? So that trailer, refrigeration. No, it trailer. is not. They, uh, I'll I'll clarify that. I've been informed that they usually move it after Thanksgiving. Last year, it stayed a little longer because um, whoever is in charge of moving it was away for or out of. Uh, you know, on family leave or something for about a month. So it was there until February and the new one came in May. Uh, the intent this year is to remove it after Thanksgiving. Thank you. I mean, I think Paul to your, I mean, I think where you're going here is, you know, that it's temporary, but we don't have a temporary um, clause in any of our ordinances. So I guess it goes back to, is this an expansion of business? Yeah, it's giving them more inventory. It's allowing them to produce more sales and have more inventory available to sell. So are we determining that's an expansion of, of business? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm starting to think that, yeah, it is. It's allowing them to be a bigger business. Yeah, Jake, I think uh, that's, that's the issue. I think you got it. Herb, Denise, Mark, thoughts, feelings towards this? I want to kind of wrap this up. We're getting to 8.30. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just. Um, Hi, Herb. I have a comment. Oh. Let's do Denise first, and then Herb. You can follow. Okay. Well, it just seems like it's a it's it's fundamental to their being able to do business that they need this backup refrigeration. I don't, I don't think it's expanding the basic use of their business. And we have a process for them to go to the. And, and, 
And I think to Commissioner Florence's point, there's a process for them to do that and to, to bring that case forward that they need this to expand their business in a healthy and, and palatable way for the community around them. Okay. But this isn't the way for, for us to give them permission to do that. It's our position that this isn't an expansion of use, therefore we don't have to go through that process. Just exactly as she was stating. We understand, yes. Herb, go ahead. Uh, just the line seemed, I mean, we're talking more about the noise than we are about, well, until just the last couple sentences about uh, the expanded use. Um, that's all that's before us is expanded use. Yeah. No more noise. Noise has nothing to do with this. And what are the benefits of going to site plan review? And what are the, what's the likely outcome of that? I mean, we can't we can't speculate on what the likely outcome is, but it, it gives a process to make sure this is a good fit for our community and the neighbors that it's allowed, and you know potentially could require some buffers or things of that nature, or there could be a, a decibel requirement or a requirement that it, you know, operates some other way or that there's, they build it, they build an expansion. Maybe they need to, to build one of the bays in and turn it into a proper built-in refrigeration unit that's running off electricity and, and condenser on the roof. It's not running off electricity, as we indicated, it's diesel, and they will not put in a permanent structure. They use these portable ones at every location. Um, there's three years left in the lease. They're not going to go through the expense unless they know that they are going to be remaining in this location. This is really a tough one. So, because then, then the business isn't allowed to expand. And so we're just saying right here that this is a business expansion, that, that the lack of this storage is, is reducing the expansion ability of this business. Mark, did you have your hand up? Sorry, I didn't see. I didn't. No, I mean, it, you know, it still feels like a temporary nature uh, with the with the swapping in and out. So I, I understand the need for the use, um, but it would be, you know, I look at it kind of like if you had a uh, the reason why they put limits on camper trailers outside homes because it's an expansion of the home. It's not a permanent thing, but it people can tend to use it that way. I, I mean, I know it's a, a commercial venture versus something you know more residential but um it, it you know it obviously is an expansion of a building in the same way that if anybody tried to an expansion and, and that's all that's before us here yes exactly that's all that's before us maybe exactly. stay focused here like it, basically no, that's what the I'm question saying. here is, yes is i think it is an expansion i think it's a necessary expansion but an expansion nonetheless i'm in agreement with that like um uh, denise Paul, why are, we, why are you guys leaving here? Um, you know, I think, you know, if it's a question of power going out, put a generator on. This is an expansion of use. Denise, do you feel it's an expansion of use or not an expansion of use? Well, I think by the, your definition, it is an expansion of use. Herb? I, uh, I hesitate <laughs> to say that it's a full-blown expansion of use because well a there's so many it's a it's an accepted practice for one thing and it it is temporary although you know is if something is okay so if a tractor trailer is parked in the same place from may to october almost or into november now we're saying that's really not temporary because you're not allowed to put you know, to have your relatives come over for Christmas. I think there's a movie about this. And let them, let the, let their RV sit in your yard for three months. That's, I think we have a six week limit here in the town, something like that. There's a pretty restrictive limit on how long you can have a tent or an RV in your yard. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really torn because I'd really, I really wish this could result in a noise issue, but that's not what's, what's before us. So technically speaking, I, I would have to go with the expanded use. I'm sorry to say. I do want to make- McCarthy, if you'd like to speak, I think we're gonna try to take a vote on this. Go ahead. The tent or RVs 
are for residential, any restrictions are residential only. There is nothing in the bylaws that dictates this on a commercial site. That's why everyone in town is doing it. Well, the, the issue of everyone doing it, I mean, everybody teaching their taxes, but, you know, I mean, everybody's doing it. Everybody speeds I go, go up <laughs> 295 or 495. You know, the speed limit is mere suggestion. Everybody speeds. That's not the issue before us. The issue is this specific issue. Um, is it expansion of use or not? That's the specific issue. I don't care if a million stores do it. This is what we're dealing with now, this specific instance. I'm happy to make a motion, Mr. Chairman. So I'm I'm gonna propose um, findings here. Uh, um, we have hold the building commissioner's determination um, and the, that we affirm the building commissioner's findings that the use of the refrigeration unit operating to regulate the trailer temperature to provide additional storage for the operation of the store is an expansion of use for the store and therefore would be in violation of chapter 240 section 100 c of the ordinance i would just add that you know we determined that it is expanding their ability to increase their business and i feel that that is an expansion of use do i have a second i have a second paul paul seconds roll call vote mark i'm in favor Denise? I'm in favor. Herb? I'm opposed. And I am in favor. So I believe that upholds the building commissioners. Wait, 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 uh, Jake, Jake, you need the fifth note. Oh. It's me, I think. Yeah, I seconded. Didn't, I didn't, oh, yeah, you didn't get Paul's up. Right, so I'm, I'm in favor. That's the fifth note. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so Paul, in favor. Okay, so um, that would uphold the building commissioners. Um, Finding. Ms. McCarthy, Commissioner Florence, thank you both for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Mr. you. You have a good evening. All right, moving along to our last item of the night. Does anyone need like a five minute break? <laughs> Two hour break. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to All right, right, we'll power through. Let's All right, an appeal number two. 2022-048, William T. Pigott and Prudence A. Pigott have applied for a special permit pursuant to section 240-91H3 develop lot protection non-conforming lot. The applicants are seeking to demolish an existing 4,132 square foot single family dwelling with and construct a 3,321 square foot single family dwelling on a lot containing less than 10,000 square feet of upland in accordance with plans prepared by James, James Philip Golden Architect and Down Cape Engineering. The property is located at 95 Sunset Lane, Barnston, Massachusetts, as shown on assessor's map 301 as parcel 027. It's located in the residence BRB zoning district. All right, so sitting on this will be our regular members and Aaron. Attorney Schultz. Good evening, Chair when Dewey. You're ready. <clears throat> For the record, Michael Schultz on behalf of the applicants, William Piggott and Prudence Piggott, who are the owners of 95 uh, Sunset Lane. Uh, that was filed in the application. Uh, since the application, uh, Prudence Piggott, there was a deed recorded in early September, vesting title solely in Prudence. Uh, so I just wanted the board to be aware of that. The property that is the subject of this petition as a single family home located at 95 Sunset Lane in the village of Barnstable. Um, and the property is comprised of 8,396 square feet uh, situated within an RB zoning district and an aquifer protection district. The property is approved with a single family dwelling, which was constructed on the lot in approximately 1977, according to town assessing records. The dwelling is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood in the terms of the size and the setback of the lot. I do set forth um, an exhibit attached to my letter uh, dated today to the board that does evidence that. Prior to appearing before you this evening, the applicant did receive approval from the Barnstable Conservation Commission and the Old Kings Highway uh, Historic District. The property is served uh, via town sewer. As shown on the site plan prepared by Down Cape Engineering and elevations prepared by James Philip Golden Architect, the applicant is proposing to demolish the single family home and construct a new one. 
the proposal meets all of the criteria set forth in section 240.91 H1 for the issuance of a building permit with the exception that it's uh, situated on a lot containing less than 10,000 square feet. In uh, respectfully seeking the special permit, the applicant suggests that the board uh, could find for a special permit, um, number one, that it falls within a category specifically accepted in the ordinance for the grant of a special permit. Um, the petitioner uh, respectfully suggests that 24091H3 is that section which would allow the board to make that decision. Uh, secondly, the proposed setbacks must be equal to or greater than the yard setbacks of the existing building as set forth on the plans prepared by Down Cape and uh, James Philip Golden, the architect, the proposed setback on the front yard is greater. Um, so it is at 19.1 feet rather than 20.1 feet. And the side and the rear setbacks are conforming in the RB zoning district. Third, all of the criteria uh, in section 24091H1, B1 through three, are met with the materials included in the filing with the board. The lot coverage is 19.9%. Uh, the floor area ratio is 0 0.395, which is less than the existing of 0 0.43. And the building height as measured from the grade to the top of the plate is 28 feet, six inches, which comply with um, the previously noted section. And finally, that the proposed dwelling is not substantially more detrimental uh, to the neighborhood. Um, the applicant would suggest that the improvement of the front yard setback, the, re the approvals from the Barnstable Conservation Commission and the Old Kings Highway, as well as it being an overall aesthetic improvement to the neighborhood uh, would evidence that it is not substantially more detrimental. Based on uh, the foregoing, the applicant would respectfully request uh, the special permit, and I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Attorney Schmitz. I'm going to oh. ask the first question that we were asked last time. What is the height to the peak? I do have Jimmy Bowes from Bayside Building. He's on the call with me, I should have those handy. It's just that the... Well, I mean, why is that relevant? I have to determine if this is detrimental to the, the neighborhood affected. I think it is a straight, I, I don't know why we don't require that we have these numbers. I know it's not don't. in the ordinance, but um, I know, but you you're asking so us that. We, we, we follow the ordinance to the top of plate and we're a foot and a half below it. And you know, above that, it's a very shallow, uh, section of a gambrel, but you know you can ask for things if you want, but it's got no relevance to it. But we get permanent. Okay, so Attorney Schultz, is the applicant's response to that that they're not going to give us the height to the peak? Well, I don't no. have it sitting in front of me because it's not something that's required. So right, I it's not like the full size plan and and uh, scale it. it. Suffice to say, uh, Chair Dewey, that the that we we are conforming as far as height is required in under the zoning definition, but the height to the ridge I would believe would exceed thirty feet. No, it right? does. And the height to the ridge does exceed thirty feet. Right. Um, I, I don't have the capability of of sizing that up, but we can get you that number. I, I also think the existing house exi it exceeds that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other board members have questions for the applicant? Uh, I have a question for uh, Attorney Schultz. Uh, does a special permit, if approved, uh, affect the uh, easement to the beach? I'm not aware of the easement, but it would have no impact on the easement. E the easement is irrelevant to this application. The lot area has been um, defined and calculated by Dan Ojala of Down Cape Engineering. He's a licensed surveyor and engineer. I did receive correspondence from Attorney Revere after my previous meetings had begun, which had questioned, you know, some of the deeds and the plans. And I've talked to Attorney Revere on many occasions on other matters where he 
um, you know, inserts um, comments and um, things for discussion, but we've reviewed before, he is not competent to, to, to testify or to explain any of that. Only Dan Ojala, a licensed surveyor or engineer would be. Well, I, I don't care who has to respond. My question is, does it affect the easement to the beach? Which is a logical question to ask since there evidently is an easement to the beach existing. And does so, this, does this special I'll, I'll answer action? that if you don't mind. It absolutely does not affect the easement to the beach. Okay, thank you. And the footprint that is existing, we're putting it exactly back on the exact same footprint, except for we made the, the house one foot shorter from the street because that was non-conforming and we shortened it by a foot to make it conforming. Okay, so the footprint is actually one foot shorter on the street side and everything else is identical. Okay, thank there, you. There's only one thing that got added because of code. Uh, one, there's a basement, they have to have a, a second means of egress and there was no um, bulkhead on the existing house. So we're just doing a four by four window well and, and it's kind of required by the building department. That's, that is it. And, and that's on the left side of the house as you face the water, which has got no, no setback problems. The right side is, you know, it's tight. So we couldn't put it there. And it's not something we want. It's something that- Any other board members have questions for the, before we open for public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll open public comment on the matter. Anyone here to speak on behalf of, go ahead, Attorney Revere. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, members of the board. Um, I represent uh, Joseph and Edith Dugas and various members in the area. Uh, I sent some material uh, regarding this matter, as Mr. Schultz mentioned. Uh, I finished it about six o'clock. I emailed it to uh, Attorney Schultz, but he was, uh, busy with not one, but two hearings <laughs> beforehand. In fact, I'm kind of glad I at least had a few minutes to uh, uh, read it in your long hearing. Uh, I bring up a number of issues and I think you might've gotten them for an email. And if there's specific questions, I did provide it to uh, <clears throat> Ms. Brigham so she can bring them up on there. The first thing is I have said that the Lot size right now is improperly calculated. And as Attorney Schultz mentioned, it appears that the Piggots uh, got divorced because they now say they're unmarried people who own the property. And Mr. Piggott deeded lot 225 uh, to uh, Mrs. Piggott. And that's the only piece of property she owns. If you look at the plan specifically, uh, there are two lots within it. Uh, one is a so-called beach lot, and the other is uh, the upland lot. The upland lot is 60 by 100 feet. And Ms. Piggott, Ms. Prudence Piggott, uh, according to the deed that was filed with you and it's attached as page three and four of the materials that I gave to Ms. Brigham, uh, she only lo owns lot 225. So she technically at this time only owns 6,000 feet of land. A secondary thing, and I uh, agree to some extent with Mr. Schultz, except I don't agree that uh, Down Cape Engineer can avoid reality of what uh, neighbors see in the neighborhood. And that is wetlands are defined differently uh, under the Zoning Act than they are defined under the Wetlands Protection Act. The Wetlands Protection Act defines something called the coastal bank, uh, but doesn't take into account whether a coastal bank actually uh, goes into an area that is uh, flooded at least on an annual basis. And the, the material I submitted uh, in terms of lot size requirements, and it's 240-7.C, Wetlands shall not be included in lot area square feet for zoning compliance. And then 240-128 defines wetlands uh, to exclude coastal bank, but it will include 
lowland subject to any tidal action or annual storm flooding or flowage. And anybody who's familiar with this area knows that beach is completely underwater at least once a year on a regular basis. And I did provide some photos that show how the rack is all up within what is designated as the coastal bank. If you look at Mr. Oge's calculations, and he is a fine engineer, no question, but in terms of defining uh, lot area, he does include uh, the land in the coastal bank. I simply said in the material I submitted, uh, which Ms. Brigham has, it might have been emailed to you, is that the ZBA should not act until it is properly calculated as to lot size. And there are two points. One is Ms. Piggott, who's really the applicant at the moment, only owns a 6,000 square foot lot. And there is some question or need of an explanation how an area that has lots of rack within it uh, gets regular storm area. Is that a wetland for purposes of uh, zoning? And I wish Mr. Ojala was here. He might be able to answer that question. Uh, in terms of the building size calculations, uh, there are a number of interesting issues, and I've set them forth. Uh, the Barnstable Assessor says that the property has 2,517 square feet of living area with a 400 square foot basement. Uh, the existing Piggott plans uh, suggest that there is uh, 3,588 uh, 3, square feet with 832 square feet of finished basement. The proposed picket plans have 3,300 square feet uh, above grade and no finished basement. No matter how you add those all up, uh, it ends up being that there is more area above grade, and that's the area that has uh, an impact on the neighborhood. I would also like to note something, and it's relevant to the next material, and this is, by the way, the existing plans and the proposed plans are attached as page seven and eight of the material I sent you. But if you look at, I've also attached as page nine through 11, the old Kings Highway plans. And Ms. Piggott uh, proposed old Kings Highway that she was going to finish the basement. Um, so there is a little confusion as to various plans and the openness of the basement and how the numbers all add up. I kind of put it in summary is there's a claim that the basement isn't going to be finished and the building is getting bigger up above no matter how you slice it. It's going from, according to the existing, being about 2,500 square feet, uh, excuse me, 20, 2,700 square feet to 3,300. It's getting bigger up above. And, and this is relevant of course, to these calculations that you look at, but it's also relevant to detrimental effect on the neighborhood. Uh, in addition, there is a large basement underneath. And now I'm sitting there and I didn't actually look at the lineup, but you can look at it as attached on pages nine through 11 of the material I gave you. But if these names Piggott and finishing basements on Sunset Lane ring any bells, uh, we had appeal 2021-69 uh, involving the Costa family on January 26, 2022. And if any of you recall that matter, the applicant back in uh, 2009 was a woman by the name of Prudence Piggott. And she obtained a special permit in which she max out the lot size above grade and agreed that she wouldn't do any more expansion. And then, as was shown in that appeal, she immediately finished the basement. She had finished it by 2011 and sold the property to the Costas. And the Costas were in a situation uh, where they had to remove the basement because they were limited by the special permit. Uh, here, as shown by the old King's Highway plans that I've attached, Ms. Piggott said she already wanted to fill the basement in this area. Uh, so it presents an interesting set of facts that is almost a rewrite of a problem the board had before. And I know the board had substantial concerns with the building commissioner's enforcement order, 
because the individual who bought the property later didn't finish the basement. But it does have a lot of the same uh, rewind of those areas. And it causes, in my mind, that the board should take some concern to look very closely at this matter. I also note, as it, and I step back, the Old Kings Highway approval had a finished basement. This application does not. I'm not disagreeing with that. There are a couple other minor differences from the Old Kings Highway approval involving windows and locations. That may be something that solely gets to be dealt with with the building commissioner. However, when you run through this, one of the most important issues in looking at all of this, rather than playing math games, is a conclusion of whether it is more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing area. I mean, this is an area that I'm sure you all well know is a series of small lots on the waterfront and has been subject to substantial developmental pressure over the last few years. It's also becoming loaded with Airbnb, VRBOs in the area. And of course, to maximize their money, money of many of these people are maximizing their size. When we look at this, as I mentioned before, no matter how you cut it, there's an increase to the above grade living space by approximately 600 square feet from the existing building. As Mr. Bowes uh, was discussing, there is no question that the plate rises approximately nine to 10 feet over the existing. That's because this is a three-story dwelling versus a two-story dwelling. According to the assessors, the building is currently a four-bedroom dwelling, and this is a proposed five-bedroom dwelling. Each of these has an impact on a lot that is 6,000 is the actual lot before you own by Ms. Piggott. Even if you expand it out to the bottom of the coastal bank, something that's not being used, uh, other, you know, it's, it has, uh, the coastal bank is a revetment. It's got huge rocks on it and it has vegetation except for a walkway through it is shown on the, that, that is not shown on the plan, the vegetation. Uh, the point is it is really a six, 7,000 square foot lot of which a large 3,300 square foot building is going on. In addition, if you look at the plan, there's both an air conditioner and a shed on the easterly side of the building that are located within the setbacks. In the uh, 2009 Piggott application in that matter, uh, one of the conditions the board placed on the special permit was it said, well, if your building is going to be on this narrow lot, we want to try to mean, maintain views and things to the water uh, and we should remove mechanical equipment and uh, essentially made open site quarters on each side of the property. Here, Ms. Piggott has applied but wants to retain a shed that is right on the setback there. And I don't even know how that shed area gets involved in the calculation either for uh, lot coverage, but it certainly is not included now. As I see it, the, there is a significant question on a number of issues in this matter, particularly how to deal with uh, an open bedroom, or excuse me, an open basement, given the past history, to deal with and consider the detriment to the neighborhood of putting a 600 square foot larger five bedroom uh, above grade structure than what currently exists. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the Zoning Board of Appeals should deny or at a minimum continue this matter to address those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Revere. Attorney Schultz, did you want to respond? Uh, I would love to, thank you. I would love to as well. Uh, for the opportunity, so I'll, I'll keep mine brief. Um, but um, again, Attorney Revere is not competent to cite to any lot areas, lot size, um, he and I have discussed it before in other matters. Uh, unfortunately, Dan Ojala, who was kind enough to pick up my phone this evening, he is on vacation in Hawaii for two weeks with his family. Um, he did say that he has calculated this lot down to the inch. 
that it meets the definition of zoning and lot, which was incorrectly defined by attorney Revere, um, which is, it, it includes from a zoning perspective, Coastal Bank. So I did send an email to Anna Brigham for the board's benefit before he was boarding a plane, but it does say that he's calculated this down to the inch and that he has, uh, that it's correctly defined under zoning. Um, unfortunately, he can't be here. Um, let's see, with respect to Attorney Rivera's comments about the grade above li living, uh, the, the living space above grade, the ordinance specifically accounts for that in floor area ratio. It can be 0.3 or what, what is presently existing. Um, so the, the applicant, and I think what Attorney Revere brings up about 2008, is completely and wholly irrelevant. This board's decision this evening would have the conditions that it would be according to the plan submitted and the basement would be unfinished. Um, so anything above the grade, since the basement is presently finished, they, they were including it. And so the gross floor, the, uh, the floor area ratio is in fact less than what's existing presently. Um, that, that's it from my end. Thank you very much. Jimmy, do you have anything to add? Yes, I do. So first of all, I want the board to understand that I, I, I understand that Paul's representing one of the neighbors and I'm, there's some bickering going on between the different neighbors and it is what it is. But this is year two of getting the permit for this house. So when you say the lot 6,000 square feet, totally wrong. Dan Ogil is top shelf. Matter of fact, he's, he's for me sometimes painful to use because he's more on the side of the board members, whether it's conservation or historic or whatever it is, than he is for the people that are paying him, me. So this project has been through the ringer and back. And when you talk about, for instance, the shed on the lot line, when you go into the conservation uh, findings, which took us three meetings, we had to remove that. So it may show up on a plan that you're looking at, but under the conservation guidelines, that had to be removed. A, a, an air conditioner, if uh, Brian Florence was here, he would know that that's ruled de minimis. You, you know, you, the, the air conditioner is there now, we're gonna replace it with an air conditioner. When you talk about the bedroom count, it's irrelevant. If you were on a lot and you were doing a septic system, then it would be relevant, but this is town sewer. So you could have 12 bedrooms if you want to, and they don't. And when you go into the issue about uh, a plan a year and a half ago when we first went to historic was talking about the basement being finished that was quickly put to bed there was if if she wanted her bedroom that's currently in the you know attic of the second floor that had to go away and you know again when you look at a, a town record of from the assessor's office they're very rarely accurate so when we were going through these different hijinks with um, not only conservation, Brian Florence's office, and Old Kings Highway, we had to do deep dives on this. And I had to, the architect come down and do physical measurements. And her existing house that's there now has 832 square feet finished in the basement. And that is going away. Did she want it? Yes, yeah, she wanted it. Is she going to get it? No, she is not. And, and there are specific rules from you guys and from Brian Florence's office that, that can never be finished. And if it is, then she can be punished. But it's kind of foolish to talk about because she knows it can't be done. We know it can't be done and it isn't gonna be done. Now, if I leave and two years later, something gets done, you know, I don't know. It's, I think it goes back to Paul's comment about people cheat on taxes. I, I don't see her doing it because she now has exactly what she wants. The first floor is expanded because she got rid of a garage bay and, and it afforded her to get her first floor laundry. So, I mean, this is a project that, uh, you know, I'm probably going to be making 14 cents an hour on by the time it starts, never mind by the time it's finished. So, you know, we've been through the ringer on this and, you know, we've met every single guideline. And, you know, I don't, within the last month, that top of, uh, 
um, you know, the top plate was at 29 and a half feet. And I went back to um, Prudy, uh, Prudence and I said, look, we're within six inches of that. I don't like it. And, and the only portion mm -hmm. that is that high is this portion that kind of looks like a um, uh, lighthouse type roof. I said, I want to lower that a foot and a half. Well, how are you going to do that? So we did. So we lowered it a foot and a half so that we were full foot and a half under any guidelines from any grade on the site. And so um, also when you talk about flooding, her lot is the highest lot on the street. And the last major flood, water was running down the street. Her, her neighbor was underwater and she was parked in her driveway high and dry. So it's a, it's an abnormal situation because she's got such a high lot. Uh, but trust me, Dan Ojala has figured that lot to and fro and back again, and he's correct. So, you know, this is, you know, we, you know, we went to conservation, we went to historic. I, I had multiple meetings with, um, Elizabeth Jenkins, when we were going through this, and we just we have done every single thing we could do right. And this last thing came up and shocked us. And this lady's already moved out of her house. She's the house is empty. We've got power shut off, and you know this was hopefully a foregone conclusion. And the house is definitely not going to be a detriment to that neighborhood. It's a beautiful home. Uh, you know, and there are other homes on the street that are teeny, and there are other homes on the street that are larger old, and there are new homes that, you know, are, are larger than they used to be, just like there is everywhere else in the Cape. So this is this is a project that you should gladly approve, and, and the neighborhood will be proud of the house. Thank you. Attorney Schultz, can you just comment on the ownership um, of the parcel or parcels that was brought up. Can, can I do that too quick, Mike? Because this all sure. happened. Yeah, go ahead. So, you know, uh, Paul's comment about Mr. Mm -hmm. and Mrs. Piggott, they did get a divorce and they were in the process of getting a divorce for the last half a year mm -hmm. and it was finalized. And, uh, you know, when they bought the property, they deeded a, a sliver of land to the people next door and that kind of, you know, one got one piece, one got the other piece. And, you know, after they bought the thing, uh, the husband did a, you know, did a quick change on the deed. So when we went to, you know, close this thing, um, Mike, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forget his last name. Mike, uh, he's at the Rotary, Mike, what's his name? Right in, right by the Holiday Tent. Oh, Gil. Mike, Mike Gill, right. So he said, look, this is another formality. You know, you know, we just have to change the names on this little parcel and, and everything goes into Prudence's name. So she doesn't own 6,000 square feet. She owns 8,000, whatever it is, 356 square feet. And that was cleared up as well. And I can certainly, I'd be glad to bring you paperwork from Mike Gill's office proving that. And, you know. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> okay. Are there any other members of the public to speak to this? So we did receive two letters, I believe. One from uh, Miss Del Densiski, if I'm saying that right, um, in opposition to the project, and. Uh, everything else was through attorney Revere that we received. <laughs> um, Anna, is there anything else I'm missing? No, you're not missing anything. Okay. Attorney Revere, did you want to have any other follow up? Go ahead. Yeah, Attorney it was Revere. just one, one simple issue. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I am not disagreeing and I, I don't think Jimmy, uh, my neighbor, Jimmy Bo, as I say this, understood what I was saying about the 6,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. The area of this lot, this property, okay, historically, there was a subdivision uh, that was approved by the land court in 1948. And there was a series of lots, and they're in what's called land court plans 17933M. And in front of them, they had a beach that was in was into a single lot. 
In the 1960s, the developer said, why am I owning a beach? And he filed another plan and he split the beach into sections that went right in front of all the other people, okay? And so there's no question that when Prudence and uh, Mr. Piggott bought the original property, they got title to the 6,000 square foot original lot and they were deeded title to the beach lot. If you look at the deed that my brother, uh, Mr. Schultz mentioned, uh, that's dated, uh, what's the exact date? It's the beginning of September, it was recorded 9-9 in September. The only thing the deed refers to is lot 225 on land court plan 17993 M. And that's the original upland portion. So Ms. Prudence Piggott only owns a 6,000 square foot lot. She did previously own that extra portion where the coastal bank is and the beach owns. She owns it with her husband, but the deed that Mr. Schultz is referring to uh, that he submitted from September only talks about Prudence Piggott owning a 6,000 square foot lot. And as I said, when I looked at that, I suggested that the board ought to at least consider the fact that as it stands right now, Prudence Pickett owns a 6,000 square foot lot and her and her husband own this extra land that's being counted in all the calculations and it needs to be addressed in some way, shape or form, either by a continuance uh, or further information or a condition to address it, to make sure that she gets it. But the deed that's there is only for the, uh, uh, the historic lot, and it's it's probably a mistake that was done by another attorney, because I certainly know Attorney Schultz would uh, miss that. <laughs> so, in any event, that is the specific point. There's no, I don't think there's a disagreement about title between us on this. I think it was more a mistake that was done when they were trying to get it back into Miss Piggott's name only. But right now, she only owns a 6,000 square foot lot in that area. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, if that is true, Mr. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jimmy. What were you saying? Mr. Buzz, go ahead. Say, you if, if that, in fact, is true, I, I'll be glad to go to Mike Gill's office and get it remedied. You know, that that the whole thing that I was talking to you about with the little sliver of land, that was something that happened like a week after they bought it 22 years ago. And he quickly said, fine, great. This this is kind of like the end of their divorce and she gets everything there. So if there's some missing portion that isn't on, she'll get it. And yeah, I don't really think that's relevant to tonight's meeting, but we could certainly, if it's true, clear it up. And I'll be glad to submit any paperwork to anybody that wants it. All right, um, so I'll make a motion. We close public comment on the matter. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right, roll call vote. Aaron Webb. In favor. Mark Hansen. In favor. Paul Pinard. In favor. Herb Bodensee. In favor. And I am also in favor. So that brings us back to the board for discussion or deliberation. Does anyone have any um, thoughts, questions, comments, feelings? Well, uh, you know, this is Paul, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the the issue seems to be this beach parcel, whether or not it's part of the lot. And if it isn't, then the lot's X amount of square feet. If it is, it's bigger. Whether it is or not, the house is, you know, it isn't gonna affect, uh, it may affect the, uh, I guess, some of the specifics of the house in terms of far and stuff like that. But the issue becomes, uh, to me, it's, whether that's part of it or not is irrelevant because it's not going to be built upon and it's protected by conservation. Um, we've had numerous issues or cases of, of the issue of views, and this may be one of those, I'm not sure, but there's no deed uh, unless it's specifically in there that um, justifies uh, a continuance of a view. So if somebody's view is blocked by this, but yet the house meets the standards, then 
uh, that's unfortunate. So uh, yeah, I don't see an issue here. Yeah, and and there are no no views that are going to get blocked from this house. The old versus the new, it just isn't going to happen. Okay, let's just try to keep it with. Uh, we close public comments. Let's just keep it board that's members. Right. Um, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I'm, I concur with Paul, and I, I sort of, uh, in just knowing the area well, you know, there are really only two houses that could have even had a potential for uh, a, a something to block a view easement or something along that line. Whether it expands from a four to five bedroom, we have no idea who the occupants could be. It could be, a, you know, parents and four children. I mean, it, it, and I don't think the half a story up really is going to be anything detrimental. I agree with Paul that it's really, at the end of the day, it's on the same footprint. And we can't presuppose anybody's going to do anything with a basement or anything along that lines anymore than we could with any other application. Uh, I don't see anything here. I think as long as the easement to the beach is is uh, maintained um, and there was no question about that, I don't see anything here. And and of course that that you know it that the parcels are owned um, contiguous. Aaron or Herb, any comments or? I'm in agreement with everything that's been said thus far. We, we've been over this several times with different cases along the way, including one uh, that Attorney Revere referenced um, and one in Osterville recently that, um, you know, talked about some buyer beware stuff. So anything relevant to Mrs. Pruden's past, I think, is or Pruden's past, or Ms. Pickett's past is irrelevant in this case. And um, so, again, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with what Mark and Paul both said. Yeah, her, 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 totally agree. Anything else, you know, registered land surveyors, if you can't take their uh, assessment of things, then we're in trouble. Um, so I'm in agreement. Okay. Um, Herb or Aaron, would you guys want to make findings? I think Mark and Paul have both done one tonight. I will take a crack at it. All right, Aaron. I've been down this road before with Attorney Schultz, so let's go to it. He's done very well by providing a, a um, uh, whatever I'm looking for, but um, template of how to answer the questions. So here we are. So William T. Piggott and Prudence A. Piggott have applied for a special permit pursuant, hold on one second, sorry, pursuant to section 240-91.H parentheses three, develop block protection on conforming lot. The applicants are seeking to demolish an existing 41, uh, 4,132 square foot single family dwelling and construct a 33, 2,100 square foot single family dwelling on a lot containing less than 10,000 square feet of upland in accordance with plans prepared by James Philip Golden Architect and Down Cape Engineering. The property is located at 95 Sunset Lane, Barnesville, Massachusetts. Section 240-91H, parentheses three, requires a special permit for all demolition and rebuilding projects. If the proposed demolition and rebuilding cannot satisfy that criteria under 2H, uh, excuse me, under section 240-91H, parentheses one, as of right, by the following criteria must be met. Lot coverage, which appears to be met, floor ratio, uh, floor area ratio, again, appears to be met. Building height, again, appears to be met. For special permits, the board is required to make general findings pursuant to section 240-125C, the board to review the evidence presented by the applicant, staff, and members of the public. And after weighing such evidence, is encouraged to articulate if and how the evidence contributes to each of the following required findings. The application falls within a category specifically ex expected, uh, accepted in the ordinance for grant of a special permit. We've been over this before multiple times. This is uh, exactly what the ordinance, I believe, is. <laughs> Uh, set up for. Site plan review is not required for a single family residential dwelling. That's number two. Number three, after an evaluation of all the evidence presented, the proposal fulfills the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance. It would not represent a su substantial detriment to the public good or the neighborhood affected. Again, we've been over this before. It appears to be a demolition rebuild uh, on virtually the same exact pre existing um, configuration that is existing now in an otherwise neighborhood uh, that is sewered. Um, which is a great, tremendous benefit to that neighborhood and so forth. Further, Section 249-91H3 requires the board to find that if the proposed demolition and rebuilding cannot satisfy that criteria established uh, is H-1 
Dash One, as of right, then the board may allow the demolition and rebuilding by special permit provided the board finds that the proposed yard setbacks must be equal or greater than the yard setbacks of the existing building. Again, we've been over this before. It appears like all the setbacks seem to meet um, and currently are uh, acceptable to what is currently there. So um, we are not in uh, disagreement over that. The proposed lot coverage shall not exceed 20% of the existing lot coverage, which is greater, whichever is greater. Again, the proposed lot coverage uh, is 19.9% a reduction from the existing lot coverage of 20.7. So again, a benefit to the neighborhood and um, less lot coverage. Uh, the floor area ratio should not exceed 0 0.0 or 30% of the existing floor area ratio of the structure being demolished, whichever is greater. The proposed FAR is 39.5%, a reduction from the existing of 43%. Again, a benefit. The building height and, and, and feet shall not exceed 30 feet to the highest plate and shall contain no more than two and a half stories. The proposed height is 28 feet, six inches to the plate. Again, not, uh, you know, asking for any uh, relief in that sense. It meets the requirement. The proposed new dwelling should not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing dwelling. We've all agreed at this point that that is the case. Those are my findings. And we need a second. Second, Mark. All right, we'll do a roll call vote in um, favor of approving the um, special permit based on the findings. Herb Bodensee? I am in favor. Paul Pennard? In favor. Mark Hansen? In favor. Aaron Webb? In favor. And I am also in favor. Um, and then, Aaron, do you have some special conditions? And then I think we just discussed, um, I think Mark wanted to make sure we just had a reference in there that the lot ownership be cleaned up as a condition. Yep, I, I, I do remember that. Mark mentioned okay. that. Appreciate that, Mark. So, uh, Attorney Schultz, you can see listed there, there's uh, special uh, following conditions, special uh, numbers one through two. And I guess there is um, the question of whether or not you are agreeable to it's been uh, fixed. I, f I found it in the registry, the, the ownership issue. It's already been fixed, Attorney Rivera? I found it fixed in there. Wow, okay. so there is no, no need for... I mean, you can put it in. I just want you to know, my, my opinion is it's fixed. Okay. <laughs> I, so I'm in agreement that a Revere... <laughs> I'm sorry, Attorney Revere has uh, proven to this board that there is no issue. Um, so, Attorney Schultz, do conditions number one and two satisfy? Uh, yes, they do. It's one to six, one to six. Oh, I'm one. sorry, I don't see the rest, I'm sorry. Mine, Same page. Mine stop. Oh, there they are. It's my, it takes a while to load. Hello, I apologize. Slow. Sorry. Yeah, very slow. So again, uh, let me <laughs> review Attorney Schultz. One through six are agreeable. Yes, they are, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll take a roll call vote on the conditions. Um, Herb Bodensee. I'm in favor. Paul Pennard. In favor. Mark Hansen. In favor. Aaron Webb. In favor. And I am also in favor. And so, uh, just just so we have absolutely everything uh, referencing the staff memorandum, September 8, 2022. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Correspondence, we have none. Matters not reasonably anticipated. Anything? Attorney Rivera, are you, are you having something or, oh, you're waving goodbye, okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Nope. Um, upcoming hearings, October 12th, October, October 26th, uh, November 9th, and December 7th. The November and the December meetings are going to be both via Zoom, correct, Anna? That's correct. I think correct. we decided that. Even yes. Though they're the first ones, because we only have one meeting each month, those months. Yes. Um, so what's what's the next October meeting? October 26th will be in person. What, what's that, Jake? Which meeting? Uh, October 12th will be in person, right? Correct. Okay. And, okay. Hi, and Herb. The three following that will all be remote. And all I'm not going to be available on the 12th. Of October. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Chairman. You're saying um, October 26th, 9th, and the December dates are all uh, by Zoom. Correct. Okay. Chairman, Attorney Schultz is waving. Oh, Chairman, Mr. Chair, members of the board, thank you very much for this evening. Have a nice night. Thank you. Nice night. Sorry it was a long night for you. <laughs> we all hung in there. Thank you.
billable hours. <laughs> Come again. Bye bye. <laughs> um, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. So move, Paul. Second, Mark. Um, uh, her vote to seek. I'll be in favor of that. <laughs> Paul Pinard. In favor. Herb, I love you, sure. Mark Hansen. In favor. Thank Aaron you. Webb. I'm in favor. And I'm also in favor, and Denise is long gone. <laughs> she checked out a long time ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> Star Market tied her out. <laughs> what do you think, Jenny? Hey, you guys have a good night.